on and off the page, in images, in honor of what's come before and what's yet to be imagined. It's definitely one of the things I admire so much about Bradley's collection, the relationship that his poems are in with other poets, with other poems, with ideas, with politics. And it's something that I admire about these other lovely poets who are going to read tonight. I am very lucky to know each of them quite well and to be in relationship with their work in a really deep and meaningful way. So let's get to it. Rob Taylor. I'm going to forego the kind of more official bios. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> uh, they're on the website. Please get to know the poets officially through their publication records. Go seek them out on the internet. But I want to flag something that Rob does in the community. No, really. It's like nice. It'll be so nice. Yes. Um, is that in addition to making beautiful poems and books of poems and taking care of his children and teaching and um, sort of being in the community, Rob has also interviewed and spoken with and been in conversation with over 90, 100, lots of poets across Canada. And he has this really amazing sort of living archive of these conversations online and in books. And I think that is incredible work that he does for us. So please welcome the always wonderful, irreverent Rob Taylor. <laughs> ready for it, Bradley. <laughs> um, thanks so much to uh, Massey Arts and to Sharita and to Bradley for this. I mean, as uh, Sharita was just saying, what a generous thing it is to have all these other people come and read and be part of the experience. It would be very reasonable for Bradley to get up and read for an hour by himself, but he's made this space for other people. I mean, that's a real testament to his book and also wisdom, because no one wants to hear a poet for an hour, but <laughs> I've seen it done. So, um, no, it's just, it's a real honor to be here. I thought I would, as the first reader, just start by reading a poem from Louise Gluck. Mm. It's an important uh, thing if you're going to be a big time poet that your name is kind of hard to pronounce. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Louise uh, passed away today. Um, I apologize for the joke immediately before saying that. Um, and um, was a great inspiration to me and to many, and today is a kind of a uh, an awful day in many regards, but I'm so glad that we're all here together, and I thought I'd just start off with a poem of Louise's. Um, it's called Burning Leaves. There's three poems called Burning Leaves in this book, because again, poets have to just kind of irritate and confuse you. Know, <laughs> this is the middle one. Uh, Burning Leaves. The fire burns up into the clear sky, eager and furious, like an animal trying to get free to run wild as nature intended. When it burns like this, leaves aren't enough. It's acquisitive, rapacious, refusing to be contained to accept limits. There's a pile of stones around it. Past the stones, the earth's raked clean, bare. Finally, the leaves are gone, the fuel's gone, the last flames burn upwards and sidewards. Concentric rings of stones and gray earth circle a few sparks. The farmer stomps on those with his boots. It's impossible to believe this will work. Not with a fire like this, those last sparks still resisting, unfinished, believing they will get everything in the end, since it is obvious they are not defeated, merely dormant or resting, though no one knows whether they represent life or death. Um, Bradley, I met uh, Bradley seven years ago. It was really neat, actually, a couple days ago. I brought him into my classes at UFE that were the same classes that he had come into um, when he was starting. I don't want to say completely starting, but very, very new, near his beginning beginning in, uh, in poetry, his journey in poetry. And um, 
it's just, he's just been an amazing person to watch. I don't know if uh, Sharina can vouch for this, but you have people come into your classroom and there's a lot of people with talent and there's a lot of people with passion and you're like, I don't know, maybe some of them will make it, you know, will become a big thing. I don't know who, it's, it's like impossible to know. Um, but what I have learned is that that passion and determination takes you so, so far and it was what Bradley had in spades talking with his classmates. Um, I knew that he had a really good chance of maybe one day, I, you know, I, he drifted off into the wilderness. I didn't know where he went for a number of years there. Um, but, um, and, but I knew that he had what it took in terms of that drive and determination to go deeper and deeper into his craft. And specifically, I came to learn into sonnets. Um, and it's just been really inspiring to see him uh, work so hard and achieve so much so quickly. It was hard for us, both of us to explain to all the first year students that seven years is very quick, but <laughs> it doesn't feel quick. <laughs> but it's been really astonishing to watch and a real um, honor. So, and I'm also just very impressed by his capacity with sonnets, which always um, uh, trip me up. Um, so this is a poem called uh, Rejection Slips, which uh, kind of honors those first difficult years trying to establish yourself as a writer uh, and the impossibility of the form that Bradley writes in. Uh, rejection slips. Three this week, denying me cash and a plumped CV to flash at perceived opponents. My new hook, love, as lureless as the rest. And now, unemployed and alone in our basement suite, it seems this blind alley, this mess of mixed metaphors, is the only theme I've left. Though today I try a turn at quiet desperation. From bed this morning, I heard you over the shower's percussion, singing. Your voice didn't waver, and for a moment, you were no woman I knew or knew how to love. And that awakening drew from me a tenderness I can't describe, which explains the rejections, I suppose. I can never say what I intend. This was to be a sonnet, for instance, and a lament. And fast forward a decade, and I'm still not able to write sound sonnets. Um, <laughs> this one only made it to 13 lines. <laughs> <laughs> but our friend Louise showed up in it, so I thought I thought I'd read it anyway. Uh, it's called Last Embers, and it opens with an epigraph by Louise Gluck. No one knows whether they represent life or death. Pot after pot, we pour upon them, back and forth from the kitchen sink, laughing at your mid-sentence pause, delivering Purdy's line, during the fall, plowing a man, the embers going as poems go, as we go, barefoot, back and forth across the grass, the house blazing behind sliding glass, but really just waiting and warm, the baby asleep further inside, Maybe waking as the glass opens and closes, feeling the air shift, smelling embers, tasting smoke, hearing his parents' laughter, and knowing then that the night, too, requires attendance, and sensing a jealousy gather faintly around him, too faintly, then easily shaking its hold. Um, I'm going to uh, just close with um, a few haiku. My next book is going to be mostly haiku. It's, a, it's actually kind of uh, similar, obsessively pursuing a form and seeing where it gets you. Um, and uh, I was telling Bradley a couple days ago that I didn't know how to read these things, and he was very encouraging. So now that you, that's his fault that you get to experience this. So the book is um, uh, three years, a poem, a poem a week for three years over the first three years of my daughter's life. And uh, that's why they're small, because I didn't have that much time. <laughs> um, so this is the third fall. This is year three fall. I'm just going to give you a few haiku from this. Um, the geese always arguing. Late summer, early fall. Mm -hmm. 
reading in leaf shadows, then reading around them. Storm clouds, the creek's song unhurried. Rubbing hands, noisy windowsill fly. Trying to explain the sugar maple leaves, half red, half green. A crow at the window bends the tip of a four-story tree. No notebook, running home past the dog park, a poem in my mouth. Her friends, stage four. My wife up late tonight, scrubbing pots. How reassuring, waking at midnight to the sound of heavy rain. Evening walk, my daughter's breath, the sea fog. with me during the pandemic and showed up for class while working another job. So it was on his phone in the back during his break, <laughs> talking to me over the, over the video, over the Zoom, which actually was kind of a beautiful way to get to know you at that time. Um, at that time, Mark was really in correspondence with correspondence, so thinking about all these nodes and all these broken connections. And some of the things he wrote about in that class were memory, place, belonging, feeding his child, uh, delicious food, preparing the food for his child, dreams, photographs, family, and home. Please welcome Mark Press. <laughs> I just noticed. <laughs> yeah, congratulations again, Brad. I, I've always been a huge uh, fan of, of Brad, Bradley's uh, poetry. I attended workshops with him and you know I awaited his feedback every time. It's always been helpful and incisive. Really. It's, uh, it's amazing just having the privilege of reading his drafts, his poetry and his prose as well. So um, yeah, and thanks you uh, for, and everyone for having me. Um, and I'm going to read uh, some poems from my, uh, from my book, forthcoming uh, from Brick Books in April. It's called uh, Dayo. Dayo basically means a stranger in Filipino, someone who's in a place not their own. I just need to find it. This is it. Okay. So actually, in uh, the class Rita was talking about, I wrote a, there's a, there's a, a, a workshop, like a, a prompt. And I'm going to read the poem I wrote in that class. It's pretty much the same. It's also the first poem in this book. Form as a living thing. The Arantalus grows in the empty lots of demolished homes. It thrives often where the toilet used to be. Form is the act of blossoming and unlikely vessels. Displacement and immobility omniscience from confinement, if not a writer within a tree, a planter or a pruner, a harvester or an indoor cactus admirer, absorb and release, breathe, spread like moss in gutters, bodies out of place, form is the leaf that sprouts from your toes, the scent of grass in your hair. That's pretty much it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and this, uh, 
just to continue uh, the metaphor, the beautiful uh, metaphor of, uh, of embers and fire, I'm going to read another poem, um, which is in the same uh, form as the one, uh, as the prompt from Shurida. It's called uh, Ars Poetica. And I wrote this just for context, I wrote this when uh, two uh, cultural workers that I really admire in the Philippines were assassinated by the Philippine government. And so, this is uh, for them. Ars Poetica. To compose a poem is to start fire. I agree. Now is the time for furnaces, and only light should be seen. Provide warmth to uncloaked bodies. To be human is to envision, dream about voices from the margins of one's bed, where bodies are enjammed like a cathedral of firewood. If not combustion, then a verse on how to reclaim love. Yes, poetry, like bread, is for everyone. And seeing your red ink shines as stars at noon, to write words that burn is arson, set one's tongue on fire. Yeah, um, this next poem that I'm going to read is, uh, uh, Brad mentioned uh, the theme of form and playing with uh, uh, the idea of the sonnet. So, um, so in the book, uh, I have, uh, forthcoming, I have, uh, I have a series of poems that I take a couplet from another poet and use it to begin and end a 14 line poem. This one made it to 14. <laughs> um, <laughs> a brief history of walls. It's only in the darkness you can see the light, says Charles in looking around. Listening to a Vancouver radio station as fascists rally on the lawn at the city hall, fighting for their right to be housekeepers and gardeners, welfare recipients. A war against drugs raging in Manila has killed more than 30,000 poor people. A victim's mother builds a union. A child dies in a desert border, and an old dude donning a MAGA hat, watching flash news on a 4K flat scheme, blames the boy for believing. Walls are permeable. A Japanese man sits cross-legged at the bottom of a forest well, mumbling, only from emptiness that things start to feel. Um, this next poem is a is a bit more uh, personal. It's a uh, it's my experience when my wife was uh, denied entry to Canada, so I wrote on a bag. A bot, an airport, and the seas. I reach for you, as though for Nomugicha, we drank at a seashore tea house in Kamakura, while you sit on a metal bench, losing your voice in separate spaces. With a brown hand, a border agent tugs, the pen holder with a tar sheer perch on a palm tree from your suitcase. Didn't you know you're not allowed? Unaware, I bought it for you in the hall on a low tide soundbar, where we tasted salty sea urchins from spiny shells, cracked in half by a sun boy who seemed to emerge straight from the sea, reminding you of a folk tale about a young fisherman and a sea turtle. As fractures mature us, I wish for waves to come, come crashing at this airport, to submerge and claim us. Another border agent could have been your sister tells us you need to leave, that you have no right to be here. Go back to the land of daybreak, across the seas where we were born without me. Thank you.
welcome. Kayla Zaga, my friend, we have been in correspondence for many years in various forms, but in your poems, you're in correspondence with art, feelings, clouds, death, travel, and most recently, Celine Dion's Power of Love. <laughs> Please welcome Kayla Zaga. Thank you for inviting me to read at your launch. Congratulations. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you, Rob. Thank you, Sharita. Thank you, Massey Arts. Um, I, it's Friday the 13th. <laughs> so I was thinking, how could I? I'm going to read four poems that are my creepy poems from uh, my book that's coming out in April. And they're also um, talking about water and the formlessness of water and then bottles kind of giving them form. So let's see how this goes. Metal detecting. On a beach littered with tourists, my machine beep beeps above old foil ghosts, above nickels, bolts, and tow rings. I've been told of newer detectors that can separate metal from metal distinguish wedding bands from Trojan wrappers, and would tell me when to stick my fork into sand, how deep to dig, and when not to bother to keep walking. But this was my father's metal detector, the one I watched him sweep over soccer fields and graveyards while I strode a few feet behind his jockey, cutlery in my butt pockets, a stainless steel smile, we filled a bucket with old pennies I inherited sooner than either of us expected, and with it, this battery-operated divining stick. Today, the sea stretches out in front of me like a tarp to lay my treasure on. The sand bottomless, a burlap sack. Beep, beep, a beer tab. Beep, beep, a nail. Beep, beep, my father. I can hear his sandals slapping his heels. I can almost see him. Beep, beep, kneeling down, twirling the world with his old fork. <laughs> Dear Brenda, in the bottle that washed up on the beach, instead of a note, I found my father's false teeth smashed into pieces like pills for me to swallow. They fell from the bottle single file, shiny airplane passengers, evacuating via the emergency slide, and I scattered them in the sand for seagulls to pick at like popcorn kernels. The sky was gray, the sand was darker gray, the sea was darker still with flecks of green between her teeth. I walked for a while and found a second bottle with a note in it, intended for someone else. Dear Brenda, it began, so I stuffed it back into its bottle, back into sand. Seagulls heckled the morning story performance. I found a fourth bottle, which was empty. Among a beached otter's garbled guts, I found a fifth bottle containing the otter's bladder shriveled like a get well soon balloon. I chose not to mention the third bottle, whose note was meant for me alone. Oh God, I thought. Will this beach go on forever? <laughs> bottle after bottle? Some filled with sand, some with distant sighs will convince ourselves are the sea. One bottle coughed up enough change for me to catch a bus and ride as far away as I could want. I found a sixth and a seventh bottle. I found the jawbone of a baby whale. My fingers were getting cold. I thought of my note, now confetti for the crabs. It told me my dad was sorry for going away. I didn't believe it, and vowed to find the note that proved otherwise, while the sea went on sucking lozenges, cooling her fevered head with salt water inside beer bottles. I picked my way among piles of driftwood, which resembled the detritus of some great wreckage I knew would take me a very long time to sort through and reassemble. Rules. Rules for living. <laughs> 
when you visit your father in the underworld, do not take a candy from the crystal bowl on his coffee table. When you visit your father in the underworld, do not take a candy from the crystal bowl on his coffee table, and do not watch reruns of Law & Order. When you visit your father in the underworld, do not take a candy from the crystal bowl on his coffee table, do not watch reruns of Law & Order, and do not leave your shadow in his bathtub. When you visit your father in the underworld, do not take a candy from the crystal bowl on his coffee table, do not watch reruns of Law and Order. Do not leave your shadow in his bathtub. And do not count the bunnies on the Pilsner bottles. When you visit your father in the underworld, do not take a candy from the crystal bowl on his coffee table. Do not watch reruns of Law and Order. Do not leave your shadow in his bathtub. Do not count the bunnies on the Pilsner bottles. And do not yawn. When you visit your father in the underworld, do not take a candy from the crystal bowl on his coffee table. Do not watch reruns of Law and Order. Do not leave your shadow in his bathtub. Do not count the bunnies on the Pilsner bottles. Do not yawn and do not ask the river of blood what your name is. When you visit your father in the underworld, do not take a candy from the crystal bowl on his coffee table. Do not watch reruns of Law and Order. Do not leave your shadow in his bathtub. Do not count the bunnies on the Pilsner bottles. Do not yawn. Do not ask the river of blood what your name is, and under no circumstances go bowling. When you visit your father in the underworld, do not take a candy from the crystal bowl on his coffee table. Do not watch reruns of Law and Order. Do not leave your shadow in his bathtub. Do not count the bunnies on the Pilsner bottles. Do not yawn. Do not ask the river of blood what your name is. Under no circumstances go bowling. And do not let the crows breakfast on your hemorrhoids. When you visit your father in the underworld, do not take a candy from the crystal bowl on his coffee table. Do not watch tree runs of law and order. Do not leave your shadow in his bathtub. Do not count the bunnies on the Pilsner bottles. Do not yawn. Do not ask the river of blood what your name is. Under no circumstances go bowling. Do not let the crows breakfast on your hemorrhoids. And do not make eye contact with the owls. When you visit your father in the underworld, do not take a candy from the crystal bowl on his coffee table. Do not watch reruns of Law and Order. Do not leave your shadow in his bathtub. Do not count the, bud the bunnies on the Pilsner bottles. Do not yawn. Do not ask the river of blood what your name is. Under no circumstances go bowling. Don't let the, do not let the crows breakfast on your hemorrhoids. Do not make eye contact with the owls. And do not ask him to come home with you. And do not ask if you can stay. And I'm just going to read one last poem. Uh, it's, this poem is Trying to Be a Villanelle. And it's also the title poem of my book that's coming up. The Midway. Finally, there's a small bottle that will solve all my problems, my father thought. And he wasn't wrong. It's impossible to have problems when you're dead. Busted from decades of night shifts, his body was an obsolete mill in a shuttered boom town. And finally, there was a small bottle a magician had conjured from, beneath my father, from behind my father's right ear, pills like clown cards to carry him far from his problems. It was impossible for anything to be wrong with Ferris wheel pupils lifting him up, offering views of the river far beyond his failed industry. Finally, there was a small bottle my father could shoot at to win himself the softest top shelf prize, the hugest blue elephant. For once, he had no problems, nothing wrong, no pain, no insomnia, no mortgage, no shame. Out of all of you, actually, he joked in an email to me that maybe we could just turn this into a roast, and that each of us could, you know, take take turns, give him a hard time. I'm gonna do the opposite of that and be very radically.
hopefully complimentary here, <laughs> which is probably worse for you. Um, it's, yeah, only to say that, as the poet Nino Polari says it, that Bradley has the talent and the taproot. And it's just so beautiful to see these poems come together in this form. And it, it's been an honor and a privilege to watch that happen. So please welcome the lovely, talented, taproody, Bradley <laughs> 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 Actually, my nickname in high school. So that's... Oh. <laughs> now I <must. laughs> Thank you all so much for being here. This is amazing. Such an honor to have so many awesome people filling up such a cool room in this beautiful city. So yeah, it's all great. Um, I'm going to be reading two longer poems and two shorter poems. So. The first longer poem that I'm going to be reading is, I think it's my favorite poem that I've ever written. It's the only thing I've ever written that I never had to edit afterwards. It just, I liked it as soon as it came out, and I still like it. So it's called Some of the Local Spots, and it starts with an epigraph. Skateboarding is a poetry of motion, Stevie Williams. And it's seven linked sonnets, short sonnets. The Pizza Ledge. The street is finally dry enough to skate. For instance, we Xerox coupons to eat for free, and waxed curbs grind themselves down into evening. Lavender-scented candles, pockets lined with graded sunlight. For instance, I go shoeless to foot race, likewise handspring. Crushed dandelion stalks feel lubed up and reek of semen and honey. Muffin tops. I'm bright for it. I run outside to eat a peach. Sugar, sugar, sugar. A bottle rocket, a green bic, a new deck with the little angel in a silk nighty and halo and high kick. Sometimes I get carried away. Sometimes I push, push, glide past hall monitors, high-vis vests gleaming erotic light, thick body spray flame in the change room dark. The plaza. Did I stutter? Did I dark slide and ride away clean? Take my bus pass. I'm transferring to Love Park to shred with Stevie Williams. I am blind in your son, Stevie. I'm that ginger punk gripping car bumpers on a stolen board with razor tail and a pohawk. I borrow your cologne on the house, on the school but stealth, on into air duct, just tuck and roll. The crank's pool. How long can you hold your breath? Do you talk? Do a dead hang on the low dive, and I'll climb up you. Goggle this midnight and how the street light touches your braces. You're out there, and I could be fancy. Let's lie down in the road, darling. The sewers moan, one plane gaps I hop. Feel my skateboard rattle as I ollie over you. If I'm moonwalking, you're a supernova. The underground. Probably the cineplex side door opens with a knife. Bring flashlights and spray paint. The abandoned parkade, perfect for tray flips, echoes and sets the darkness rhyming. I stomp at bolts, loiter, solicit boots. Probably hand-me-down dickies and garage moonshine from plastic spoons, Benadryl puke, half-naked, sweet mama thinks it's spaghetti poison. Sorry, mom. <laughs> <laughs> I used to paper bag, but now I just blow. Seven Oaks. Maybe church, but I doubt it. If eyes closed, heads bowed, I'm open on holidays. The gymnasium is waxed, and I'm power sliding across galaxies. People say dark matter or loudspeaker, but I'm here for hot buns, baby. For instance, heavy drum solo, and show me one fence unjumpable. The field is empty. I'm going way downtown. It'll be a long night, so help me God, just give me a wet dream and fresh grip tape. <laughs> Elisa's backyard. Shepherd me, O oh Lord, O oh lovely, into your father's treehouse. I am a scar's width of dusted sunlight, 
bright as OJ spilling across your plywood floor. The bottle is spinning. I double dog dare you. I exhale and lean on your shoulder. You make me want to shoplift on Molly, read Keats, pop fakie into a lens flare. I practice my break dance. Keep me out after dark. So the inspiration actually for that poem came from Rob Taylor in his class. I remember he really wanted to write a poem about ultimate frisbee. And I remember him telling me he, he wanted to just fill it with all the dialect and all the language of ultimate frisbee. So I stole that and wrote my skateboard. So my book has uh, three, they're called crowns of sonnets, and it's where the last line of the last sonnet becomes the first line of the next sonnet, and then the last line of the last sonnet in the series is the first line of the first sonnet in the series. <laughs> it's super fun, really. <laughs> you should all tell your friends about that. <laughs> Everybody will love you at all the dinner parties you go to. <laughs> but I'm going to read a couple shorter sonnets from one of the crowns, and you can see how the last line becomes the next first line. And this one, it's called Old Age and Wolves, and it's, I really wanted to read it because this is a room full of poets, and I have a line that really just gets to the heart of what it means to be a poet. Finally, yeah. Oh, yeah. This is going to answer all of our questions. <laughs> So this one starts with an epigraph. Um, all of my poems in this book all start with epigraphs. Some of them are academic, some of them are poetry. This one is prison and jail, telecom, commissary functions have spawned multi-billion dollar private industries. Old age and molds. I laugh and laugh till Warden fears the Dutch. The Dutch is a salve for old age and wolves. Old age and wolves are frenemies on break. Frenemies on break with new flip phones laugh, then punch each other in the arm too hard behind the sunglass hut. The sunglass hut, oh last bastion of laissez-faire markets, your poster is one badass dog, a pug, the spirit animal of all poets, since all poets are part noble, part doomed. <laughs> Dude. <laughs> Doomed to daydreams, their drill tests of glass teeth and death. Death with a mouthful of red birds. They flap and climb over one another. Red birds staring out, plucking themselves bald. And now the next poem is red birds. This one has an epigraph. Perhaps prison itself is seen as a dehumanizing institution, meaning that the longer one serves, the more one is seen as lacking human-like capacities becoming more like an animal over the course of a prison sentence. Red birds staring out, plucking themselves bald. Red birds on a spiritual retreat. Red birds tear Bibles in half and eat lunch. Red birds huddle and laugh with hooch red tongues. Red birds whiff the singe of mace on raw skin. Red birds push all in with 12 ramen packs. Red birds, barred meds, heed the voice of madness. Red birds struck past cell doors, wordless and slow. Red birds, once freed, fly off into nothing. Red birds, rust toned with false teeth and moth breath. Red birds, still wince at keychains and flashlights. Red birds, steal stakes to return each winter. At night they dream, they clack their beaks and flap. In the hush, all their hearts patter like rain. This is so nice. I'm going to hold you guys hostage. I'm just <laughs> so this is uh, a longer poem, it's a series, seven sections, um, yeah, I'll just read it. It's called Postcards from Inside the Machine, and it starts with an epigraph. Come havoc, come mayhem, come down God and see us, 
come. John Murillo, Contemporary American Poetry. In this section, the first one's called Peckerwoods. In cuffs, in cuffs, willing myself clean, one pulsating streetlight at a time, while the cop swims around me with his flashlight, cutting the fog, and his face appears pale and glistening from the red and blue glare like something being born. What are you doing here? He says, and pats me down, sighs, back steps, blinds me. A perfectly nice kid like you. I'm a straight Caucasian male. I'm white. I could be his son. Preach. I step into my cell, ready to kill or be killed. Officer, I too love. Power, respect. I share your sense for danger. A black man, shadow boxes in the corner of his mind next to Bibles, caught between the valley of the shadow of death and sizing up his new bunkie. Shirt tucked, sleeves rolled. Officer, I too fear the unknown. He glances up. You religious men? I shrug. Well, that's something to work on, he says, and smiles. Fish. We all watch the dead man walk across the unit and smile at each table with his meal tray like it's the first day of school. The dead man looks lost. He can't be more than 18. The dead man sports bangles and a bright red turban to match the jumpsuit draped on his frame like PJs. The dead man's dead, he just doesn't know it yet. He grins, clears his throat, nods at the shot callers. I reach, out at, I reach out to him and touch nothing but air. Torpedoes. The hills have eyes enters my cell. Me. You can't be in my room. Hills. There's a Hindu on the unit. Me. Wait, don't come any closer. Hills. The back table wants him gone. Me. I said stop. Back up, man. Hills. And you're going to bounce him. Me. No, I'm not. Get someone else. Hills, I said you're going to bounce him. Me, I'm just trying to do my time. Hills, or I'm going to bounce your head off this toilet. Me, get the fuck out of here. The Hills Have Eyes exits my cell. Dinner and a show. Meanwhile, in Canada, an inmate with a Hitler stash raises red fists and shouts, I'm the king of the world from the second tier like it's a pulpit. Meanwhile, in Canada, a Stolo kid returns from 80 days in the box, wrists gnarled by chips of cinder block, and tears all the Bibles in half. Meanwhile, in Canada, my bunkie, Preach, plays aces as a sock lock blooms a pair of red lips atop his dome, and the COs unload two cans of mace on everyone. I fall off my chair shield myself, and later I stand and return to my cell unscathed. <coughs> Sock lock. I sense with the knife edge of my eye, bodies shift in the chow hall. Looks, nods, and the white arc of the sock appears like a sight of tilting light above your head. Forgive me, preach. I'm not all I hoped I was. That night, we blazed into the toilet's vacuum and promised backup. We both knew it was you who had to fight to survive. You laugh across the table. I sit frozen in the moment between grin and lock and think, maybe it won't come down. Maybe you're safe, Preach. Maybe it will just suspend above you forever. Taking flight. At lights out, I climb metal steps to go fight the hills have eyes. His cell is third last down the tier. My shirt is tucked, my laces cinched. I'm resolved and ready for whatever. The CO shouts 10. The lights dim. I'm not trying to be some white hero. Open doorways to my left 
radiate indigo and TV babble and inmates shift in the half light. Two OGs cross the unit, nod and smile up like, go on then, Blondie. I'm trying to learn my place in all this. I close my eyes for a bit, then I enter his room. Thank <laughs> you.